everyone who has an experience of salvation can relate to this. The drops of grief can ne'er repay. (laughs) You know, the fact that we humble ourselves and we become convicted and we come to the Lord crying and sobbing, as oftentimes sinners do, that can never repay the debt of love that I owe. (laughs) But I give him my all. The only thing that I have myself My self-will, I surrender to Him. And that's what's required for salvation. That's required of each and every one of us for salvation. To lay hold on that prize, we have to surrender ourself and our own self-will and our own desire to govern our own lives and our own ways. And at the cross is where we find that relief. At the cross, that's where those tears are wiped away. At the cross, that's where that burden is lifted off of you. The weight of sin, the weight of the corruption that you've created in your life and the destruction that you've created in your own life, those things are lifted off of you. Praise the Lord for salvation. Praise the Lord for what Jesus Christ has done in my life. And I trust in yours too. But you know, it doesn't all end there we get up from there and we start to walk with God and we start to move forward we start to grow in knowledge and understanding at least that's the plan that's the design that God has for each and every one of us not for us to stay just groveling before the cross drowning in our misery but his plan is redemption it's the plan of redemption That means you get lifted up from that place, you get dusted off, cleaned up, wiped clean, and you start a new life. You start moving forward. Now, as you proceed in that spiritual life, it's been my experience, and I'm pretty certain that it's been your experience, that sometimes you get into little places where it seems like things slow down. You get caught in a rut. Stagnation sets in. Am I right? That's what happened in my life. How about yours? Is that something you're familiar with? What's that, brother? We need to examine ourselves, ourselves, absolutely. And not only examine ourselves, but then sometimes we need to take some action. And I want to read tonight from Genesis chapter 31. It's the story of Jacob. And this is picking it up when Jacob is about to leave Laban. He has been serving Laban for 20 years. Now, if that's a rut, if that's not a rut, I don't know what a rut is. 20 years he's been in this place. 20 years he's been serving this man, his father-in-law. But he was serving this man To start with, he thought he was going to serve seven years and he was going to receive the love of his life, Rachel. But this man deceived him and tricked him. This man worked to pull the slick one on him. He said, no, no, we didn't make that agreement for Rachel. Here's Leah. You can have Leah. In fact, he kind of snuck Leah in under the darkness, under the cover of darkness, and Jacob didn't discover until the next day that he had been fooled. So... They made a deal. They made another arrangement. Seven more years, and you can have Rachel. So, Jacob honored his word. Jacob honored what he said he would do. Seven more years he served. Then, he still had nothing but two wives, right? So they made some more arrangements. They made another agreement. But this man, Laban, was deceitful and greedy. And we pick it up at the time where Jacob was about to depart. Jacob had had enough. And you know, as we read through this tonight, we're looking at a literal story that actually happened. But I want you to see the spiritual parallels in your own life, and then I want you to see the parallels for us as a congregation. There is a time when we need to pick up from the place that we are spiritually as individuals, And we need to start moving forward. 
No longer letting the devil deceive us, trick us, and keep us in the place that we are. But if we want to grow spiritually as individuals, we have to make a decision. I'm not going to stay in this place any longer. And that's exactly where the point that Jacob had come to. I'm not going to stay here any longer. I'm not going to be tricked and deceived any longer. I'm not going to be held back anymore. But I'm going to move from this place. And sometimes that's what we need to do in our spiritual lives is to say and commit that I am no longer going to let Satan hold me here, but I want to grow. I want to see this congregation grow. I want to see it expand. We had a pretty good crowd this morning. Sunday night, we got a little crowd. You know what? I'd like to see such a congregation that on Sunday morning they had to wait until Sunday night because there was no more room. Amen. They had to get back in their cars and leave. We'll come back Sunday night because there's not enough room this morning. I'd like to see that. But we'll never get to that point unless we make a decided decision that we're no longer going to stay here, but we're going to get up and we're going to start doing some things. We're going to start taking some actions and we're going to start moving forward. Not missing the opportunities that are presented to us. Let's read Genesis chapter 31. And this is speaking of Jacob as we start here. And he heard the words of Laban's sons, saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's, and of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this glory. Now, although Laban had tried desperately to um, deceive and to trick and to overcome Jacob, Jacob, by the power of God and by his own cunning and wisdom, was able to grow his herds while Laban's herds stayed stagnant. But that didn't satisfy Laban. It didn't satisfy Laban's sons. They wanted what Jacob had accumulated by his own hands. Verse 2, And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not towards him as before. And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers, and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. And Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field unto his flock. And he said unto them, I see your father's countenance, that it was not towards me as before, but the God of my father hath been with me. And you know that with all my power I have served your father. And your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God suffered him not to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckled shall be thy wages, then all the cattle bear speckled. And if he said thus, the ring straight shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring straight. Thus God hath taken away the cattle of your father and have given them to me. And it came to pass at that time, at the time that the cattle conceived, that I lifted up mine eyes and I saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which, were, which leaped upon the cattle were ring straight, speckled and grizzled. And the angel of God spoke unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here am I. And he said, Lift up now thine eyes, and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring straight, speckled and grizzled. For I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest, anointedest the pillar, and where thou vowedest a vow unto me. Now arise, and get thee out of this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. Wherever you find yourself tonight, whatever your spiritual position, whatever your spiritual rut that you may be in, God doesn't want to keep you there. God wants to see you grow. God wants to see you move forward. God has no desire to see you stagnated and stuck in a position. Some people think, well, I'm saved, that's all I need to do. No, you need to grow. You need to move forward. And it's God's desire for each and every one of His children to grow in wisdom and knowledge of Him and to prosper. Satan is the only one that wants to see you stagnated because he knows if he can get you stagnated spiritually, he can slowly get you to regress or fall away spiritually also. Let's read a little bit further. 
And Rachel and Leah answered and said unto him, Is there yet any portion of inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not counted of him strangers? For he hath sold us, and hath quite devoured also our money. For all the riches with God, which God hath taken away, taken from our father, that is ours and our children's. Now then, whatsoever God hath said unto thee, do. This is his own daughters now. Think about this for a minute. This is his own daughters saying, our father has just taken everything that was ours and spent it. He's a greedy old man. And he's tried everything within his power to take what we have. And he's accomplished that. Continuing on a little further. Then Jacob rose up and set his sons and his wives upon camels. And he carried away all his cattle and all his goods which he had gotten, the cattle of his getting which he had gotten in paid Dan Aram, I think is how you pronounce that word, <laughs> for to go to Isaac his father in the land of Canaan. And Laban went to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the image that were her father's. We're not going to touch on that, but <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that one alone. And Jacob stole away unawares to Laban the Syrian. In that he told him not that he fled. So he fled with all that he had, and he rose up, and he passed over the river, and set his face towards the Mount Gilead. And it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob was fled. And he took his brethren with him, and pursued after him seven days' journey, and they overtook him in the Mount Gilead. And God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night, and said unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. What happened when Laban found out that Jacob was gone? He got angry. He said, I'm going to go and get him. I'm going to pursue him and take back what's mine. A greedy man. And let me tell you, the enemy of your souls is just as greedy, just as deceitful, and wants just as much to go wherever you, if you start making some spiritual progress, if there's some spiritual progress that's made in this church, in this congregation, the devil wants to pursue and take back whatever it is that we gain, whatever ground that we accomplish in gaining, he's going to be right on our tails, pursuing. But thank the Lord, our God will not allow him to touch a single thing if we stay true to him. God spoke to Laban. He said, take heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. Verse 25, then Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mount. That's good spiritual advice, my friends. If you want to pitch a spiritual tent, make sure it's in the mount of the Lord Jesus Christ, in Mount Zion, the church of the firstborn. If you're going to come to a resting place, not a dwelling place, did you hear I said a resting place, make sure you're resting in Him, ready to get up and move on from that place. He came and now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mount and Laban with his brethren pitched in the mount of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What hast thou done that thou hast stolen away unawares to me and carried away my daughters as captives taken with the sword? Wherefore didst thou flee away secretly and steal away from me and didst not tell me that I might have sent thee away with mirth and with songs and with tabaret and with heart? And hast thou not suffered me to kiss my sons and my daughters, that thou, thou, hast done, thou hast now done foolishly in so doing? Were those Laban's daughters anymore? Had not Jacob worked for them? Had not Jacob dedicated himself stayed true to his commitment for 14 years for both of those young ladies. They were no longer Laban's daughters, but they were Jacob's wives. But you hear how Laban worded things? Do you know how Satan attacks your mind? Same exact way. Same exact way. Anytime there's spiritual progress, there's going to be spiritual resistance that goes along with that in our lives. There's going to be somebody resisting. 
that's mine. Why are you moving out there? Why are you doing this? Why are you suddenly uh, testifying? Why are you suddenly witnessing to this person or that person? You're going to experience resistance each and every time. Verse 29, it is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. But God of your, but the God of your father spake unto me yesternight, saying, Take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. And now, though thou wouldest needs be gone, because thou sore longest after thy father's house, yet wherefore hast thou stolen my gods? And Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid, for I said, Peradventure thou wouldest take by force thy daughters from me. With whomsoever thou findest thy God, let him not live. Before our brethren discern thou what is thine with me, and take it to thee. For Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen them. And Laban went into Jacob's tent, and went into Leah's tent, and into the two maidservants' tents, and he found them not. Then he went out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the images and put them in the camel's furniture and sat upon them. And Laban searched all the tent, but found them not. And she said to her father, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise up before thee, for the custom of women is upon me. And he searched, but found not the images. All spiritual resistance is searching for something in your life, searching for something in this congregation that it can use to condemn us. The devil wants to find something in your life that he can use to attack you mentally and condemn you with. He is a master tactician, just like I said this morning in the message. He finds if one way doesn't work, he works moves around over here and he tries another avenue, another means of attack, another direction of attack. And he does that in all of our lives, not just mine or this congregation, but every one of you personally. He tries to find something that he can condemn you in your mind with. What do you think Laban was doing? Laban was going around in the tents trying to find anything that he could put his finger on and say, that's mine, Aha, you stole from me. You're guilty. That's what the devil wants to do. He wants to make you feel guilty. He wants to destroy. He knows that if he can bring about guilt in your mind, he destroys spiritual progress. Guilt destroys spiritual progress. You go backwards. When you've got a guilty conscience, you go backwards. That's what salvation is all about. Cleansing the conscience. Renewing the mind. Making it pure before God. Satan hates that. And will do anything within his power to make sure that he finds something that he can lay his finger on to condemn us and bring guilt upon us. Verse 35. Actually, verse 36. I'm sorry. And Jacob was wroth and chode with Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin that thou hast so hotly pursued after me? What a blessed position for us to stand in as individuals to be able to look our opposition in the eye and say, What is my sin? You know, only a pure life can do that. Only a pure life can move forward in spiritual progress and grow in the things of the Lord. Are you able to say tonight, what is my sin, Satan? What is my sin, you opposer? And when people start to work around and attack the congregation, we as a congregation need to be able to stand united in love and unity and say, what is our sin, my friend? What have we done? You know what? That takes real commitment to love, to unity, to togetherness, Amen. brotherhood, sisterhood. Amen. It takes real concerted effort to make that happen. To be able to stand in a united front and say to the enemy, what is my sin? 
What have I done? Let me tell you, that douses the fires of opposition like nothing else that you can throw on top of it. When you can stand with a clear conscience and say, what is my sin? Boy, that just puts out all kinds of fires of opposition. That drives the devil out of the room when he has nothing to condemn. Now in this particular one, Rachel, she's pretty deceitful young lady, but she had stolen from her father. If he'd have found that thing, he would have found something. But God allowed it not to happen. Jacob continued in verse 37, Whereas thou hast searched all my stuff, what hast thou found of all thy household stuff? Set it here before my brethren and thy brethren, that they may judge betwixt us both. Jacob was pretty upset. Jacob was on fire. He was dynamite. He said, look here, you old codger. What do you think you're doing? Pull it out. Let's see your accusation. Let's see your evidence that I've done you wrong. After these 20 years that you've kept me bound here in this place, you're going to bring up these accusations, these false claims? We need to get some boldness like that, my friends. To say to the devil, to say to the opposition, 20 years we've been faithful, 50 years we've been faithful, whatever the time you've been serving God faithfully, to say, all this time, who do you think you are? To try to keep me where I am. Who do you think you are to try to keep this congregation from growing and multiplying and being fruitful? Verse 28, this 20 years have I been with thee, thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast their young, and the rams of thy flock I have not eaten. That which was torn of beast I brought not unto thee, I bear the loss of it. Of my hand thou didst, didst thou require it, whether it was stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was in the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. Thus have I been twenty years in thy house. I served thee fourteen years for thy two daughters, six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages ten times. Oh, how Satan loves to keep us bound in the place that we are and just jerk us around like a little dog on a leash. That's what he wants to do. He wants to have you on a leash where when you get too far moving too long, he wants to jerk you back. That's what Laban was doing to Jacob. He was jerking him all around. Changing his wages, changing the contracts, changing all the agreements. You're going to find out in a minute as we continue reading. He never gives up on that. He, keeps on, he wants to make more and more and more agreements. Whatever kind of agreement he can make to keep you where you are, he's willing to stand up and say, yeah, I'll agree to that. But he's not faithful. He's greedy. He's deceitful. Thou hast changed my wages ten times. In verse 42, Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely thou hadst sent me away now empty. God hath seen mine affliction and the labor of my hands, and rebuked thee yesternight. He stood up with boldness and told Laban just like it was. Get off of my back. God is with me. God has seen what you're trying to do to me. And I'm telling you, as a congregation and as individuals, we need to stand up. And we need to rebuke the devil. We need to tell him, God has seen my affliction. God has seen what this congregation has been through. God knows we preached this morning. He's the beginning and the end. The first and the last. He knows it all. It's all within His power. He knows what we've been through. Amen. He's brought you this far. Amen. Do you think He wants to see this place die? No, <laughs> no He don't. He don't want to see it die. But He wants to see it grow. And He wants us to get some backbone and start taking some actions that will make it to grow. 
that will help it to multiply. See the opportunities. You want to know what Jacob did? He could have got discouraged after he served 14 years for the two wives. He could have got really discouraged. He could have given up at that point. But Laban made another deal with him for cattle. But by that time, he, had a, he knew what Laban was all about. He knew how crooked he was. He said, okay, Joker, you're going to make deals with me. I'm going to make some deals of my own. And he started using his wisdom. He started using his ability, his mind, to turn things into his favor. He didn't get discouraged with another contract that was going to be broken by Laban. But he used it. He's seen it as an opportunity. And we can look at our current condition, we can look around tonight at all the empty pews, and we can moan and groan, and we can stay in this rut where we are, or we can see those opportunities. That's all I see. I see the opportunity for about 8 to 10 souls down that pew right there, about 8 to 10 more there, and about 8 to 10 more there. We can look at it from God's perspective, or we can look at it from our little human perspective and say it's impossible. This, all this space, we'll never see this place full. I believe that with God, all things are possible. There is nothing impossible with Him when we will put it in His hands and when we will start taking actions and we will start using our own mind and we'll start using our own opportunities. Do you know how many people you meet in a day? How many people you talk to in a day's time? Are we witnessing to those folks? Are we taking advantage of the opportunities that we have? You don't need to be Paul. You don't need to be Peter. You be who you are and start witnessing to the ones that God puts in front of you. You are His servant. You are His child. You are His disciple. He gave you a role to play in this world. He gave you a certain amount of souls. He knew how many interactions you were going to have in your lifetime. God, help us to see the opportunities that we have. God, help us to be bold. God, help us to use those times to witness for Him. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That's, that's one way you can witness to people. Do you know that God knows about the pain you're going through, the struggle you're going through? There's another way you can witness. How are you today? How's your life going? Do you know Jesus? Simple little words. But we get caught in the rut that we've been in. We get caught in the cycle of life that goes on and on and on and on, day after day. And we lose that boldness to speak out for Christ. Let me tell you, if we don't change, we don't take advantage of the opportunities, just like Jacob did, we'll never see growth. God can give us all kinds of opportunities, but if we don't speak up, we won't see growth. It won't be God's fault. He's willing. He's able. But the ball is squarely in our court. We have been left here to carry the gospel into all the world. That is our role. I want you to notice as we read the rest of this chapter. Verse 43. Laban was full of more promises. Laban, he just went on and on about guarantees and covenants and agreements. The devil's got lots of agreements. He's got lots of things he can put out there for you to agree to. Oh, if, you, if, you, if you'll do this, then it'll be okay if you go over here and you do these things. Let me tell you, every step that you take, every opportunity that, that you have should be seen as an opportunity to witness for Jesus Christ in some way, shape, or form. Don't let a single person go by you that you don't give some kind of testimony and witness to. I need this in my own life because I get caught in the same cycle of life, the same rut, just around and around and around you go. 
oh, I'm just waiting for the right opportunity to witness. I just spent 20 minutes with them, but I'm still waiting for the right opportunity to witness. How many others do that? Amen. I just spent two hours with them, but I'm still waiting. You know, I, I just got to wait till the thing is right. Sometimes you just need to get out of your rut. And just go ahead. Try a little boldness sometimes. He said his word would not come back to him barren, but it will always bear fruit. Let's read on. And Laban answered and said unto Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and these cattle are my cattle, and all that thou seest is mine. And what can I do this day unto these my daughters, and unto their children which they have borne? Now therefore come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they did eat there upon the heap. And Laban called it some kind of long, complicated word. But Jacob called it Galeed. Galeed. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Therefore it is the name of therefore was the name of it called Galeed. And Mitzpah, for he said, The Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent from one another. If thou shalt afflict my daughters, or if thou shalt take other wives besides my daughters, no man is with us. See God is witness betwixt me and thee. And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold this pillar which thou hast cast betwixt me and thee. This heap be a witness, and this pillar be a witness, that I will not pass over this heap to thee, and that thou shalt not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. And the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge betwixt us. And Jacob sware by the fear of his father Isaac, then Jacob offered sacrifice upon the mount and called his brethren to eat bread. And they did eat bread and tarried all night in the mount. Early in the morning, Laban rose up and kissed his, daughter, his sons and his daughters and blessed them. And Laban departed and returned unto his place. The first verse of chapter 32 says, And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. That verse 55 is really what prompted all of this this evening. The vent, at the end of verse 55, it says, Laban departed and returned unto his place. Now immediately the human mind says, okay, Laban got up and went back down to his camp. But I see Laban getting up from that place where he was and morally, spiritually, he had not changed one bit. He went back down to his place. The place where he had been before. The same old attitudes, the same old behaviors, the same old greediness and deceitfulness. He went right back to the things that he had always been involved in. He went back to his place. That's why I jumped over and read the first verse of chapter 32. Because Jacob went to a different place. Jacob made progress. And when Jacob moved out, what happened? He met the angels of God. Jacob didn't make an agreement with him and then turn and follow him back down into the same old rut. He didn't return back to his place, but he kept moving forward. He kept going forward. And when he did, he met the angels of God. Oh, what a lesson for us spiritually that if we will not remain in the same place, if we will move forward, God will meet us. God will send His messengers along the way to help us, to encourage us, to provide for us. When you speak those simple words of witness, the angels of God will be there. The Spirit of God will be there to drive those little words home into the hearts of the souls of people who need to know Jesus Christ. Just move forward. 
Just take a little initiative. Get a little bit of boldness. See every person as an opportunity. Maybe I could win this one to Jesus Christ. Maybe. They have to make that decision, but don't let, you, don't let the opportunity pass you by. We have a choice. We have a choice as individuals and as a congregation. We can depart and return to our place tonight. And I'm not talking about your physical home, but I'm talking about your spiritual condition. You can get up from here and you can leave and depart back into the place where you were. Or you can say, tonight I've decided that I'm going to be bold. I'm going to see every person as an opportunity. You can start moving forward from the place where you are. And have the possibility of meeting with the angels of God. Oh, what a blessed thing. That there is the distinct possibility that you might run into an angel of God. I guarantee you, if you depart and go back into the place where you came from, if this doesn't change you at all, this has no effect, if this is just water running over the same old dam, you're not going to meet the angels of God. It requires that you move forward. What must we do to grow? Jesus said, Luke chapter 11, verse 5, ask, seek, Knock. That's what I'm asking you tonight. I'm asking that you would begin to knock. That you would begin to seek. That you would begin ask that God would help you to see the opportunities that God would help you to say the right words that God would assist you I understand you're human beings just like me you have all the same tendencies that I deal with you have the same shyness right you have the same tendency to not want to you know, put yourself out there, stick your neck out. What happens when you stick your neck out? Sometimes you get whacked. <laughs> Sometimes you get hit. Sometimes it hurts to stick your neck out. Don't be afraid. Ask, seek, and knock. Let's read Luke chapter 11, verse 5 on down through there. These are the words of Jesus. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is in for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. You know, so often I feel like that I don't have the right words. I don't have what this person needs. You know what? I'm exactly right. I don't have what that person needs. But the one where I knock and the one that I seek to, he has everything that's required for their needs. You don't have all the right words. You don't have all the right formulas. But our Lord Jesus Christ does. Let's continue on. And I have nothing to set before him. Verse 7 and he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask of any of you that is a father, will you give him a stone? If he ask for a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he ask for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? 
If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? (laughs) How much more shall your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit? If there's something we need when we're out speaking with people and we're out sharing Christ with people, it's the Holy Spirit driving those words, directing those words, Causing them to be implanted into people's lives. I can't give you a formula tonight. I would love to give you a little track and say, you take this track and you go out there and read and you're going to see souls saved. No, you're going to see a lot of people make surface commitments that have nothing that's rooted in the truth. That's what you're going to see. But when you get the Holy Spirit driving, directing, motivating, using you, Oh boy, you'll see major things happen. You'll see lives that are transformed. Not just a surface intellectual agreement to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but transformed souls that will live eternally in heaven. And that's what we're here to build. That's what we're here to build. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. Let's ask God tonight for that precious gift of the Holy Spirit guiding and directing our lives. Let's ask God tonight to help us to recognize each and every person in front of us as an opportunity to share His Word. Don't let Laban direct your life. Don't let the ruts, the spiritual rut, be the characteristic that defines your life. That's what happens. We talked a little bit about characteristic this morning. Characteristics. Characteristics don't just pop into being. They're little tiny actions that accumulate, that become a pattern that slowly begin to identify you. What's the characteristic that's identifying you? Is it inconsistency? Is it the rut? Is it the same old thing that you've been in? God can change it. Cast your bread on the waters, it says in Ecclesiastes. What does that mean? You're just going. Too many times we want to feed a particular fish. We see one over here. Man, that's a nice big fish. If I could get that one, boy, that would be an awesome prize. Right? We get singled in on one one person. Ecclesiastes, the writer there, said, cast your bread upon the water. The bread that you have to cast is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And don't get too concerned about trying to catch one little fish over here. The world is full of fish. Cast your bread on the water. Seek and you shall find. Let the Holy Spirit be the driving force. Let Him do the work in the hearts of mankind. You just sow the seed or cast the bread. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You, Father, for this time of worship and study in Your Word. Oh God, I pray this evening that your people would turn to you in in a deep and meaningful way. Father, that they would begin to seek you. That they would begin to knock and to ask, Father, for your help in their lives. As they go forth from this place, I pray, Father, that they would not return to their place. But that they would move forward in their spiritual lives. That they would receive the boldness that they need to go out and to be a witness for you. Help us, Lord, to cast our bread on the water. Help us, Lord, to recognize that every soul that we come in contact is an opportunity to change their eternal destiny. Lord, this is not something that's just petty. We're talking about eternities. God, I pray that you would impress upon our heart as we meet these individuals in our day-to-day lives that their eternal destiny 
could possibly lie in our hands and whether or not that we shared the gospel with them, whether or not that we reached out and took advantage of the opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for the examples of faithfulness in your word. We see the faithfulness of Jacob, how he toiled and he toiled and he toiled. And then one day you spoke to him, Lord, and said, it's time to get up. It's time to go. It's time to move. Father, I feel like never before. It's time to move. Move forward spiritually. Not staying in the place that we are currently in, but growing with you. I ask, Lord, that each and every one would examine their heart, that you, Lord, would examine their heart. Reveal their condition to each and every one. In Jesus' name we pray.